Hi, uh, welcome. In my series on science today, we'll talk about Kepler's laws of planetary motion, essentially the laws that govern the moving of the planets as they go around the sun. Ever since the ancient times, people have tried to understand the motion of the heavens, how the star, the moon, uh, and the sun go around the and travel in the sky. Some people had divine reasons. They just wanted to understand the design that God had in mind when he created the universe while other people were passionate astronomers they were fascinated by the stars and their uh, movement in the night sky a huge deal of work was done from Ptolemy to Copernicus Ptolemy gave us a geocentric model in which earth was at the center of the universe while the planets went around uh, planets went around uh, planets and the other heavenly bodies rotated uh, with the earth at the center. Copernicus gave us a much different model in which sun was at the center of the universe and earth went around uh, the sun just like other planets did. Uh, while Copernicus's work took us a great deal forward there were still many questions that were unanswered such as why are there only six planets not two or a hundred uh, and what keeps the planets moving is it why don't they stop and and what does the orbit of these planets around the sun look like and what about the speed at which they orbit the sun is it always constant things like that copernicus had tried to answer some of these questions in his book he assumed that sun was at the center and that when planets went around circling the sun the motion was uh, uniform circular motion which means that the orbit was uniformly circular perfect circular and the speed of the planets was constant he quoted divine reasons for this he felt that if a divine geometer was going to uh, design the universe and build the universe then he will choose perfect shapes and a circle was a perfect shape for such a design however these assumptions were later found to be incorrect by Kepler and uh, who we will talk about today. Uh, Kepler used the astronomical data uh, by Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe was another great astronomer of the time and his data was the most extensive and most most precise at the time. It was the time when when uh, uh, telescope was yet to be invented. So today we will essentially meet Kepler and Brahe and we will discuss Kepler's laws of motion. Johannes Kepler. Kepler was born in 1571 and he was so uh, he was introduced to astronomy at a very early age and he he said that he was uh, took to a high ground where to observe the great comet of 1577 uh, and he developed a love for it that lasted an entire lifetime. In 1589, uh, Kepler attended the university and where he was introduced by his mentor to both Copernical system and uh, uh, Ptolemaic system. And this was the time when the debate had not been settled whether Ptolemaic system was right or Copernicus system was right. Ptol uh, uh, Kepler adopted Copernicus system because it very resonated very well with his, res his uh, religious beliefs. He believed that God is the central figure around whom everything else revolves and that sun is just a metaphor for God and uh, is a metaphor for God and our earth revolves around this God uh, is, is, was his idea. When he became a teacher at University of Graz he had a great idea and it, it was this epiphany that why are there only six planets and the answer he thought was in platonic solids. So what is the platonic solid? A regular polygon is a polygon that has all sides equal, right? A platonic solid can be thought of as a three-dimensional extension of this polygon. A platonic solid is a solid whose all sides are regular polygons. For example, consider a cube. If in a cube all sides are the same, they look all faces look same then it's a platonic solid it's one of the platonic solids there are only five and exactly five such solids and ever since the time of Plato and Pythagoras these platonic solids have been extremely uh, extensively studied and they are kind of religiously celebrated and revered uh, in Plato's theory these solids played a great role in God's design and he said that God created the universe 
and with these four solids earth air water and fire were assigned four solids and that uh, god used the fifth solid to create the sky and and fill it with the stars kepler also thought and believed along the same lines he felt that in the design of solar system in the design of designing the the planets and the orbits god had used these platonic solids and this was his model it looked like as follows that you take these five solids and you circumscribe and inscribe them uh, with a sphere so you take one solid and you inscribe it with a sphere and then you circumscribe it with another sphere then on top of it you place another platonic solid and then you circumscribe it yet again put another platonic solid circumscribe it yet again this way you will get six layers so he felt that on on these six layers god placed six planets so that we get six orbits however this this was a very elegant model but it did not agree well with the actual observed data copernicus had measured planetary orbits but kepler's design did not match with these orbits kepler was very confident in his theory it looked very elegant to him so he felt that maybe the observations are incorrect in science there are if there are only two possibilities either your observations are incorrect and your theory is right or this is more often the case that observation is correct and your theory needs to be modified at that time there was only one man in the world who had access to better uh, observations and that man was tycho brahe as chance would have it and i am thankful that that happened he had just invited kepler to join him as his assistant in prague now tycho brahe was born in 1546 and he was a very skilled astronomer lived a very character for life i encourage you to read about it for example one time he uh, challenged a fellow student to a duel uh, just so that he could settle a fight over a mathematical formula and in this fight he lost part of his nose and wore a golden news nose for the rest of his life ever since the time of aristotle he it was believed that the cosmos beyond after after which was farther than the moon was constant and immutable and not changing however in 1572 tycho brahe observed something amazing he he saw that a star had just appeared in the constellation cassiopeia i mean there was no star until yesterday and then today suddenly new star never seen before in the history of mankind has appeared and he observed parallax for this object over several months and found that there was no parallax which which meant that this thing in the night sky was very very far so and he wrote about this in his book the nova stella in 1573 and we now know that this thing was a supernova 1500 light years from planet earth called sn157921572 also known as tycho supernova so this was this was a proof that aristotle's view was wrong the cosmos does change over time it it continuously changes during uh, the his observations the planet that that confused brahe most was mars we have already talked about how mars in the night sky does it slow loop a loop and uh, does this retrograde motion well all planets do that but but uh, mars's orbit confused kept uh, brahe the most and he Uh, mentioned it to kepler most often they had con- collaborated for about 2 years up until the death of uh, tycho brahe which i actually encourage you to read about how brahe died uh, but until tycho brahe's death uh, they he mentioned mars to kepler often and it was the most confusing <clears throat> after brahe's death kepler was able to get all the data that tycho brahe had Uh, and he used them to deduce his laws he kepler also started with copernicus's hypothesis of uh, planets going around the sun in uh, uniform circular motion and he also had divine reasons he felt that a div- divine geometer if he was if a divine geometer was going to design the universe it bet it'll be built using perfect circular shapes but no matter how hard kepler tried the observations will not match circular orbits even though he was using more precise data of tycho brahe now there comes a point in science where you know that the observation is incorrect it got to be your theory which is 
th that the observation is correct that it got to be your theory which is incorrect so kepler had to finally get get ha let go his uh, circular hypothesis and he tried to fit an elliptical orbit and voila elliptical orbit fit very well on the available data but let's quickly talk about ellipse and ellipse is essentially like a circle that has been squished into an oval uh, there are two focus in uh, uh, an ellipse and the it is just the points which are the where the sum of the distance a and b a plus b is constant uh, a circle is essentially a special case of uh, an ellipse where the two focus coincide into a point uh, so Kepler's first law was this that planets go around the sun not in circular orbits but in elliptical orbits and sun is not at the center but at one of the focus of the ellipse and this is how the motion in 3D looks like that planet Mars going around the sun and at some points it's farther from the sun and at some points it is nearer to the sun and this was Kepler's first law and the reason why Mars's orbit is so uh, puzzling is because it is the most elliptical in solar system earth also has a elliptical orbit but it is very close to a circle I mean you can't really tell whether it's not whether it is not a circle and slightly an ellipse and thankfully Kepler studied Mars because had he studied let's say earth or, or uh, Venus he would he might not have reached the conclusion and never have discovered the true shape and stuck with the uh, circular orbits. Kepler's second law. Now it was believed in uniform circular motion hypothesis that the speed at which planets go around uh, the sun that speed is constant however the observation again did not match well with the with this theory it was found that the speed does change over time and the planets are they move much faster when they are closer to the sun and then they slow down when they are farther away they speed up when they are closer to the sun and then they slow down Kepler noted that there was an underlying pattern in this change of speed and he his second law said that planets sweep out equal areas at equal times it essentially looks like this that when the planet is closer to the sun it moves faster when it's farther away it moves slower however the speed change is in such a way that when it's moving faster the area that it sweeps is still the same that's that's essentially the idea uh, and in 3d it looks like this that this is let's say planet Mars going around the Sun and the dis the area that it sweeps out in equal times is is equal so that's why when it is closer it has to move faster and when it's farther it moves slightly slower Kepler's third law while the first two laws were published in 1609, the third law was published 10 years later. Uh, now it was known that the planets that were closer to the sun made a loop uh, faster around the sun as compared to the planets that were farther away. Mercury for example was makes its uh, motion around the sun in just 88 days and it's that's why it's named after the Roman god uh, Mercury because Mercury was the messenger of the gods and Mercury travels in a mere 88 days while consider Pluto Pluto takes 246 earth years 246 years if we lived on Pluto we would not see even one year before we die even our children of children of children our great 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 ancestors would see a new year so Kepler found that there was a relationship between the distance of a planet from the sun and its orbital period around the sun and this was its third law roughly speaking his third law states that the square of the orbital period is proportional to the cube of the distance that if t be the time and d be the distance t square is proportional to d cube to explain you better assume uh, Jupiter Jupiter is five times farther away from the sun as compared to earth so if its time is t then t square has to be proportional to 5 cube so t which is its orbital time is roughly 5.2 to the power 3 upon 2 which is roughly 11.8 and sure enough its Jupiter goes around the Sun in 11.8 years and that's what Kepler's third law is essentially it looks like this that planets which are inner go faster take much less time to circle the earth and the planets that are 
are farther away take longer time to go around the sun and this is the chart of predictions made by Kepler's third law and we see how they line up very well and the beauty is that 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 these predictions match up well for Uranus, Neptune and Pluto and these three planets were discovered much later after much after Kepler gave his uh, third law and that's the beauty of science in science if you propose a theory it not only has to meet all the observations till date it also has to meet all the observations into the future if Uranus for example and Neptune and Pluto had been out of sync of this line we would have no choice but to throw this law throughout this law uh, but it matches predictions very well and that's why we have this law so to conclude uh, it was actually later even discovered that Kepler's third law even applies to moons of Jupiter and in fact these laws are everywhere in the universe where we see any two bodies circling around each other we see that these laws are approximately followed the question is why why are planets following these laws in fact here is another question that I wonder Kepler's second law states that planets speed up when they are closer to the Sun and slow down when they are farther then they speed up when they are closer to the Sun and then they slow down how do they know that Sun is present I mean they somehow obviously detect that Sun is there because they speed up and then when they are farther away they slow down so planets must somehow be sensing the distance from the Sun but the question is how how is Sun letting planets know that I am present I am near you go, go speed up and that's a question we don't know yet similarly another question we have not answered is that what is so magical about this ratio of t square to d cube why are planets doing that and another question we have not really answered is that what keeps the planet moving I mean on earth if you set something into motion it eventually comes at rest why are planets not moving what keeps them moving why don't they stop so all these questions remain Kepler proposed for the first question above that the force that Sun applied on the planets was magnetic force because that was the only force he knew that acts at a distance magnetism did not turn out to be the force that Sun applies on the earth it will actually take a few decades for that force to be discovered why because Isaac Newton was not yet born thank you